Hi, and welcome to my presentation, examining the use of the constraint-led training approach with the development of technical skills in field-based team sports for SAC 7103. Now, the outline and the objectives of the presentation are to give a clear understanding of the constraint-led approach, the CLA, to critically evaluate the evidence around the CLA in the development of technical skills using small-sided games and field sports, to evaluate the coaching process in the CLA and to give some practical recommendations for the use of the CLA through small-sided games in Gaelic football. Now, a team sport includes any sports where individuals are organized into opposing teams which compete to win. Now, for the purpose of the demonstration at the end of this presentation, I'm going to use Gaelic football as my team sport of choice. Now, it's widely accepted that to achieve excellence in any sport, players must spend a considerable amount of time trying to improve performance through practice-related activities. A constant observation is that elite performers in sports accumulate more than 10,000 hours of practice before reaching an international level of performance. Therefore, practice design becomes a key consideration for coaches. Now, skills can be practiced in blocked or random manners under constant or variable conditions. A block schedule may involve practicing one or two skills per session, whereas a random practice would arise if a variety of skills were practiced in a somewhat random manner throughout the session. Now, the evidence would suggest that a random schedule, while detrimental to short-term performance, is better for long-term retention and learning than blocked conditions. In fact, a study by Farrow et al. of random versus block practice evidenced that open skills were cognitively far more demanding than closed skills. And when we consider that the research shows us that increased cognitive effort has previously been associated with greater skill learning and that block practice drills are unlikely to optimally develop decision-making ability, a compelling argument can be presented in support of game-based training for developing technical and perceptual expertise. Now, one such approach that could be used to achieve this is the constraint-led approach to skill acquisition, which is based off ecological psychology and the dynamic systems theory. Proponents of the CLA consider that learning is non-linear, with the learner being described as an open dynamic system. A learner on the skill development journey will pass through periods of stability and instability reflected by varying levels of variability in movement as they attempt to effectively self-organize. So what are constraints and where do they come from? And in the 1986 book chapter by Carl Noel called The Constraints and the Development of Coordination, it provided the first version of the official image of the CLA, the Constraints Triangle. And we can see this here on the bottom left of my screen on figure three. Now, Noel contended that our movements are not prescribed and that they emerge because of a self-organization process that are bound by the ever-changing constraints that are imposed upon us. Now, in Newell's model, there are three types of constraints that an athlete must accommodate when coming up with a movement solution, environmental, task, and individual. And it's the interaction of these different constraints that force the learner to seek stable and effective movement patterns during goal-related activities. Now, when we look at these constraints, the individual or the performer constraints refer to unique structural and functional characteristics of the learner. And these could include factors such as physical, psychological, cognitive, emotional makeup. Then we have task constraints. And the, these consist of the goal of a specific task, the conventions of an activity, and the implements used during the learning experience. And it's worth noting that in contrast to the other constraints, the coach can easily manipulate task constraints. And small manipulations in the task constraint can lead to large scale changes in the learner's behavior. And then finally, we have environmental constraints, and these are presented as physical, which could be like gravity or altitude or playing surface, weather conditions, so forth, and social cultural factors such as peer groups or cultural expectations. Now, for an individual to engage effectively with other individuals in his or her performance environment, he or she needs to detect key affordances within that location. And an affordance refers to a property of the environment which can be detected as information to support an action. And this is a very important concept to understand when we have a look at the second key to the CLA puzzle, which is dynamics. 
And in follow-up work, follow work done by Newell and others, a second part was added to Newell's triangle. And this is called the perception action loop cycle. And we can see this in figure four. And this cycle conveys some important aspects of the CLA. Now, firstly, to understand and shape the process of self-organization around constraints, we need to understand the perceptual information available in the environment and the intrinsic action dynamics of the performer. Secondly, in this model, there is circular causality, and that is that perception doesn't cause movement, nor does movement cause perception. There is a mutual interaction between cause and consequence because our movement changes how we perceive the world, the effect of an event instilling on a movement returns to influence the original event, which was our perception. So in a nutshell, the development of a movement solution is created within the perception action cycle. So if learning is characterized as the development of effective perception action couplings, the aim of the practice environment should be to help the athlete to build these synergies. This means that constraint manipulation must be based off the key pillar of task representativeness in order to provide the opportunities for learners to attune to key affordances and develop appropriate perception action couplings. Now, when we evaluate the coaching process and the CLA, we must, we must consider what I stated at the outset. The CLA is based off the dynamic systems approach to coordination, which proposes that skill emerges when the elements of a complex system, in this case our bodies, um, spontaneously organizes in a process of self-organization. Therefore, the overarching goal of any constraint manipulation in the CLA is to facilitate the process of self-organization. Now, I feel that many coaches use constraints. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're using the CLA model. Uh, and I'll just give you an example of that. So a Gaelic football coach may design a practice session to improve shooting accuracy in which he may have a player shoot through a goal size which is two foot smaller than the official size goals. Now, when doing this, the coach is manipulating the task constraint, i.e. the goal size. However, if he or she also gives feedback, like you need to plant your lead foot when you kick the ball, they're not doing the CLA. By adding corrective feedback, the goal of the coach now becomes about trying to get the, the player to adopt one ideal shooting technique, as opposed to allowing them to self-organize to their own movement solution. If you're manipulating the constraints, um, if you're manipulating the constraints of a task for any other goal other than self-organization, then you're not doing the CLA approach. So if corrective feedback or explicit information is added, by the coach, then they're just changing the conditions of the practice as opposed to applying the CLA approach. And I think that's really, really important to point out because for many coaches, the term constraint means that they feel that they're forcing the athlete to use one movement solution or at least a narrow range of movement solutions by restricting their movement. And this brings around the idea that constraints leads us to one ideal movement solution, which is not what we're looking for at all. For example, if you modify the size of, an, of, of equipment like a hockey stick or a baseball bat based off the age or the size of a young athlete, you're not limiting that young athlete. You're actually giving them more opportunities. In the CLA, we do not constrain to constrain. We constrain to afford. Now, one main task constraint that's often manipulated by coaches in field sport is pitch size. And much of the evidence base is based around this. And I'm going to touch on that in a moment. But it takes a considerable amount of skill and expertise and experience to create these environments. And research has shown that increased time spent planning was seen to be a major factor in affecting the quality of the game-based activities and practice sessions. And in addition, questioning um, was seen to be a contributing factor to allow players become independent thinkers. And I think that this is, this is something to be cognizant of when we are um, considering our coaching process. Now, when we have a look at the evidence, okay, around the CLA, firstly, uh, we can have a look at Timmerman and colleagues, and they found that when they reduced um, the player numbers, it increased the number of skill actions um, within the session. So the number of successful actions, the number of successful passes, 
and the number of successful skill actions went up and the number of players went down. And in addition to that, they also found that the number of high pressure situations increased. And I think that that's really important to point that out because skill in many ways is just technique under pressure. So finding those high pressure situations can be a very important part in the skill acquisition um, process. Tanning colleagues evidence that changing the game rules can affect swarming or non-swarming tendencies in team sports. Orothin colleagues evidence how interpersonal interactions between attackers and defenders based on variations of, of key task constraints, such as distance between attackers and defenders, the ball and the goals um, during performance can shape skill performance and decision-making behaviors. Then Davids and colleagues illustrated how emerging actions and decision making um, of players can be modulated in small sided games by manipulating specific task constraints, such as changing initial distance between players and modifying the player rules. In addition to this, uh, I also found that the frequency, or Bennett et al, sorry, found that the, the, op the opportunity for frequency um, to practice specific skills is really um, found through the use of small sided games. And in addition, uh, I also found research around enjoyment and small sided games can produce um, passion for playing the sport. Now, when I delved a little bit deeper into the research and I looked at the, the research around technical skills in small sided games, when it came to player numbers, what I did found, find was that as the player numbers increased, there was a reduction in technical skills for um, a single player. And again, that was just validated and was in line with some of the previous research I had found. When it came to um, player numbers, or sorry, pitch size, uh, there was no real conclusive evidence around uh, pitch size and technical demands, uh, even though I did find that at 30 by 20 um, imposed greater technical demands. But I do think that this comes with a word of warning and making the pitch size too small can have a negative impact in terms of the loading on the players just from a physiological standpoint, especially in the start of the season when they may not have built up the certain capacities to tolerate the eccentric loading through um, the small sided pitch area. And then uh, when I had a look at the rule modification, what I did find that players have more difficulty performing technical skills than the number of ball touches was limited. And another interesting finding was that the rule of ball possession produced a higher technical demand than the rule of goal scoring. Now, when we look at the CLA in action, what I actually have done here is I've designed a game here where it's a four by four situation in a 20 by 20 meter grid. And the whole um, purpose of the sub phase that I'm trying to develop within this is developing on winning the breaking ball from a kickout. Now, the ball must be bounced in order to give possession of the ball and once a player is in possession he must break the tackle and bounce the ball to um, a teammate and the players must try and hold possession by bouncing the ball to each other. I think that in designing these four by four small sided games um, it just allows, allows us to amplify the information for the control of actions by providing increased opportunities for actions between players to occur. And you know, players will develop these co-adaptive movement behaviors rather than decoupled ones that we'd get um, by dribbling around cones or passing in straight lines. And I think that again, these small sided games allows us to, you know, just become attuned to the action capabilities and opportunities of their teammates, which is critical in developing these shared affordances for affected teamwork. So you can see how we have this task representation. So you can see in the image to the left, we have a player in the middle looking at the high breaking ball and you have the player circled and moving in to, to win that. I have an arrow um, pointing towards that. And if you can see in the drill that I have laid out to the right, um, we have that same representative design with number of players and the player approaching in to win that breaking ball. And again, that's where we're looking for this task um, representative design. Um, when we look at the skills that we're trying to develop in terms of gaining the possession, he can crouch lift, he can high catch, he can body catch, he can low catch. To maintain the possession, he can bounce it, he can touch it, he can use his four steps, um, he can evade, he can sidestep. And then you have all these other technical skills that are movement skills that are also um, involved in the, 
in the, the game as well. So when we actually just let the game roll for a second. So you can see that they have to make this bounce pass. We have this small, small sided grid. The pass has to come from the bounce. And we can see that we have this element of evasion within the, the skill as well. So again, there's no goal scoring opportunities in this. And this links back to the findings that I did find previously that the, the technical demands on the skill is greater when maintaining possession is the, the, the performance outcome that we're looking for within the specific task. And um, thank you for, for watching my presentation. You can just see my reference list outlined. And again, I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, thanks for watching.